Greetings. Welcome to part two in our lecture series on evolution by natural selection. Uh, last time we left off, I introduced you to the, um, the case study of the peppered moth. Um, and uh, hoping that you remembered, um, the, you know, the big takeaways uh, there were, was that essentially uh, we had uh, moths that could be born one of two colors, both before and after the Industrial Revolution. Um, and before the Industrial Revolution, when uh, trees were rather white in appearance, the, the moths that were born looking this white color, those white peppered moths, um, tended to fare better than the black peppered moths that were born. Remember, this was ju just due to genetic variation. You got lucky or you, you didn't, you know, depending on what color you were born. So if you were born white before the Industrial Revolution, you got lucky because you blended in. And your blending um, allowed you to be better adapted to your environment so that the birds didn't didn't eat you, essentially. Um, and so uh, ecologists actually saw peppered moths evolve over time so that before the Industrial Revolution, the majority of peppered moths were born white because those were the ones that survived and passed on their DNA um, to their offspring. On the other hand, once the Industrial Revolution came along, uh, and trees got covered with all of this soot and smog from neighboring factories, they found that the moth population actually had to evolve. Remember, populations evolved. Individual moths couldn't just spontaneously change colors to now blend to a darker colored tree. However, if they had offspring that were born a lighter color, those were, or sorry, if they had moths that were born the darker color, now they would survive because they would blend and the lighter colored moths now were disadvantaged to survive. So that was our first case study when it comes to evolution. You actually see this all over in nature. It's not just with moths. You see this with beetles, right? If, if, if this was an environment um, where uh, let's say these beetles were surviving in, in gra a grassy knoll, obviously the, the beetle you would want to be would be the green beetle because you'd blend in with the grass. But on the other hand, if we change the environment to be sand or a beach, you would want to be this these tan or, or um, brownish colored beetles because those would be the ones that survive. So um, the, the biggest point that we try to make with these case studies is that it is always the environment that drives evolution. Uh, animals adapt to fit their environment. Now humans are an exception to this of course because humans by our very nature we don't like to adapt to the environment. We like to adapt the environment to us, right? Instead of uh, you know growing really really thick layers of fur to warm ourselves up, we build houses and we change our environment. But most animals cannot do that so they must evolve as populations. Okay so um, what, how do they do that? They develop something called an adaptation. They adapt to their environment. Now, I know you've heard this term before, um, that things adapt, but the problem with the, wor the way that we use uh, the word adapt in common lingo is that we use that right to say that you can adapt. Um, when we switch to online schooling as a result of the uh, COVID-19 outbreak, whoops, sorry about that, right? You guys all had to adapt to learning on the internet the way that we're doing right now. Um, but remember, when we're talking evolutionary adaptation, you're born adapted to an environment. Uh, you cannot you cannot change your DNA again after birth. So I needed to emphasize that because I need to let you guys know that an adaptation is an inherited trait that increases your chance for survival. It's not some a trait that you can change. It's not a, a learned or acquired trait, okay? So what are some examples of adaptations, which is actually gonna bring us into um, our next activity. There are many, many, many examples of adaptations. As a matter of fact, if you name any living organism on the planet, you can see how it's been adapted. So we're going to look at a couple here today just for fun. Um, we could look at the white-tailed deer here in um, in uh, Wisconsin, for instance, and the white-tailed deer has adapted in many, many, many different ways, but I'm going to point out too, um, obviously the white-tailed deer has adapted to have a large um, antler rack, and it does that mostly as a result of, um, of sexual selection. Um, as it turns out, does 
does prefer male bucks to have larger antlers and the larger and more ornamental the antlers are the more successful that that buck will be at finding a mate um, but there's another um, really interesting thing about the deer here i don't know if we have any hunters that have ever noticed this but white-tailed deer have this little marking on their lower jaw and this is actually called a false canine, right? This is um, supposed to give the illusion that they have this large canine tooth and make white-tailed deer look a little bit more vicious than they actually are um, to try to ward off potential predators. So that's an adaptation. Um, deer that were born with this, this um, little bit of pigmentation here turned out to be eaten a little less often than deer that didn't have that. So white-tailed deer now have that really cool adaptation. Um, we see adaptations everywhere else in nature too. So we can see them with the African elephant, right? And, and elephants are adapted in so many different ways again, right? They have these massive ears because they live in a rather arid climate and they're huge, right? Bergman's rule usually says that um, animals get bigger as they move more north and south of the equator where it gets cold but an elephant lives rather close to the equator right where it's pretty darn warm all the time so how does it regulate its body temperature as a warm-blooded animal um, if it's so huge it has this massive amounts of surface area and capillary beds in their ears to allow for heat dissipation off of their ears right they're adapted another way right they're huge and it's really hard for them to bend so they have this really long trunk to help them pick things up off of the ground they've got a lot of, of, of adipose fatting in their foot to help dampen them as they walk, right? I could go on and on with these adaptations. Um, zebras are really, really amazingly adapted. Now, now, some people don't realize that this pattern on zebras um, has a very important function. So I'm going to show you this in a picture here. Um, if you take a look at this photograph, um, this is something called flicker fusion. You see this as well, this adaptation in fish. Um, this is actually an Apple desktop wallpaper that they um, came out with years and years ago, but I've always loved it because if you look here, right, it's almost difficult to tell. If you're a lion, it's difficult to tell where one zebra ends and another begins, right? Like you can actually see right here, if you guys can see where I'm looking, there's actually four zebra here, right? But these zebras all sort of run together and almost look like one gigantic animal rather than individual animals. So flicker fusion is a really cool adaptation that some organisms have um, to help confuse um, predators uh, by making them blend in to their larger groups. Lung fishes. So I'm going to hope that this works, folks. I'm, I'm going to try to have my microphone pick up the audio here. Um, so you can learn a little bit about the longfish because these are super, super cool. Southern Africa is home to a very primitive fish with some extraordinary abilities. It's the lungfish, and while it has gills like any other fish, it can also breathe air directly using a modified swim bladder that acts as a lung. When water levels are high, this isn't so important, but the rains will eventually fail, and the constant burning sun will dry up all the water. Fish are left flapping at the surface as the waters disappear. Only the air-gulping lungfish is able to cope with these extreme conditions, but it's still exposed to the heat and is still at risk from predators, so it relies on another, even more extraordinary ability. It finds a new, safer home buried underground. Digging down by eating mud and pushing it out through its gills. To stop it drying out, the lungfish exudes a special mucus from its skin, covering itself in a thick layer that hardens to form a waterproof cocoon. Only a single hole is left for breathing. Baked into this mud sarcophagus, the lungfish slows its metabolism to 1 60th of its original rate, relying on its muscles and body fat as a source of food and water. It becomes just another piece of hardened mud, and lungfish have even been known to end up as an accidental brick in a mud hut wall. But this isn't the end for the lungfish. It can survive like this for an incredible four years. Eventually, it could end up poisoned by its own waste products. But in this case, the onset of the rains is its salvation. As the mud walls are washed away, the lungfish's hard mucus lining is softened. It's been four years since it last used its muscles, and they're very weak 
As it breaks free of this mud cocoon, it still manages to drag itself towards the nearest source of water. It's the ultimate survivor. And although it's underwater now, it'll soon be back in the mud, repeating the whole process again and again as the annual rains come and go. Now, if that's not an adaptation, I don't know what is. That is amazing. Uh, so I just love that it ended up in, in, a, in a brick for one of those homes. So that's, that's how the lungfish has adapted itself. Um, I mean, obviously we see adaptations in giraffe with the size of their neck in order to leave, uh, reach taller foliage and branches. And of course, sperm whales are a remarkable story of adaptation too, since they're able to dive so much further than, than uh, most other um, mammals without being crushed. And that's because they have this really cool, oh, sorry, I'm gonna grab an arrow here. Sperm whales have a really cool, massive chamber of wax in their head and that's actually where they get their name sperm whales it's right it's not because they're shaped like a spermatocyte or anything like that they have a giant waxy chamber in their in their heads um, uh, called spermaceti and that allows them uh, their heads to be able to withstand the pressure of the deep ocean while they're while they're diving for um, while they're diving for these these giant squid and these colossal squid. Um, so it's just really an amazing adaptation that keeps them, like most other organisms would be crushed, but they're adapted to withstand those deep, deep pressures. So you don't see this only in animals, by the way. You see really cool adaptations in plants too. Um, this right here is a, is a picture of a, um, of a walking palm tree, which I've always found really fascinating. And when I bring kids to Costa Rica, we do see these. We don't see them actually walking, of course. Um, but the, uh, the, the root system of a walking palm tree is so superficial and it, um, it, it, it's so well adapted to seek out sunlight, something called phototropism, that the entire tree will actually move, to, like if you see sunlight over here, this tree will move towards the sunlight. So um, if you were to go back to Costa Rica, you know, a couple years from when you previously visited, that tree will have moved several feet to find um, more sun to engage in photosynthesis, which I think is just a, another really cool adaptation. You see adaptations in other plants too, like carnivorous plants, right? This is a pitcher plant, and this plant is actually adapted to not only photosynthesize, but also to get some of its nutrients by dissolving bugs, because they particularly need a little bit of the nitrogen that's in the exoskeleton of bugs. So just lots of cool adaptations, and, and ultimately, and this is going to lead us into our next activity for class, but ultimately these adaptations result in something called a niche or a niche. I've heard it pronounced both ways, but um, you should know that every single animal on the planet has a niche, right? And that is just its function, its job, its role in an ecosystem. Every animal has a role, um, whether you think it does or not, and that's um, called a niche. And the niche is a result of um, is a result of the adaptations. So that is it for today. Um, as always, if you have any questions, you know how to get a hold of me. Thanks so much.